Thank you for joining me today. Uh, what am I doing? I'm stitching in a zip gusset, and this is going to be going on a briefcase. Uh, latest course, the Cutler briefcase, is, the second part is coming out very soon. So this is one of the projects that we need to finish off, and it is a zip gusset. So this is what goes all the way around the top of the briefcase. In fact, I have it within arm's reach here. So some of you may have joined me for a previous live where I was stitching in this part here. Um, so this zip gusset is going to be starting around here, going all the way across the top and down the other side. Uh, and that allows a full opening that we can actually get a laptop in there, which is one of the main reasons that we have this. How are you doing, guys? Say hi. Let me know uh, how this live is going. I know sometimes uh, internet can be a little bit uh, iffy out here in the sticks. Not really, but it's just a bad signal. Uh, so let me know if the uh, if the audio is fine and the visual, of course. Hey, Christian, how you doing, buddy? Thank you for joining. So any questions as well? Don't forget to uh, to let me know what questions you have during the live. So it's going to be me saddle stitching this. Uh, a little bit different to, to normal because what I'm stitching the leather to through the zip tape is canvas on the rear side, if you can see here. So it's uh, a little different to full leather. Sounds good, looks good. Thank you, Rick. Live and crushing it, says Adam. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Wheeler. That's good to know, because looking at the camera, it's, uh, it's actually really choppy, strangely enough. As in, it looks like it's five frames per second. So as long as you're not seeing that, that's okay. The quality, uh, quality my end doesn't really matter too much. I can see myself in HD most of the time. So stitching this in at uh, three millimeters, so quite a fine stitch, to be honest, for uh, you know a large-ish case. Something that uh, I actually prefer overall, slightly finer look. It really depends on what it's going on. Maybe like a, a larger attache case, you know, five, even five and six stitches per inch. So a large stitch, but I have actually. Uh, Kind of changed my tastes, gone oops, gone to a bit more of a finer stitch recently. And da, da, da. We all know the finished product is going to be amazing, says Adam. <laughs> no pressure, no pressure. Yeah, I think it's a nice looking case. Looking forward, I'm actually having a lot of fun with this one. Uh, it's, it's nice to work with uh, leather and canvas. It's one of those things that goes really well together, a little bit like brass and leather. You know, there's certain things that just pair up really well. And uh, I've always liked the look of, of canvas and leather, especially off-white canvas with tan or cognac in this case, and a, a matching thread to go with the canvas. It's always been one of my favorites. Such a classic look, really. <laughs> Stuart says, smooth on my end in Michigan. Do I remember what the first product I ever made was? Yes, I do remember the first product I ever made. Um, a friend of mine, I, I lived in Canada at the time, and a friend of mine had, uh, had a, like an amateur forge. And he made uh, knives and saws and things like that. And I always uh, was into the outdoors, still am really. And I wanted to make myself like an outdoors knife. But I wanted to have a, a little bit of story, a little bit of history. And my brother-in-law at the time had a shed full of his, his dad's tools from when he was a carpenter who was, was in his eight, late 80s at the time. And uh, a lot of them were just rusted away. And uh, I found in there an old Nicholson file uh, made from hardened tool steel. 
very good tool steel, W2 tool steel, I think. Anyway, so I thought it'd be really cool. Obviously, it wasn't usable anymore. It rusted and was no good to anyone. It'd be really cool to turn that old file into a knife. So I did. Uh, me and a friend of mine had a project going on, made the knife, et cetera, et cetera. So my first leather product was the sheath for this knife. So I remember going to uh, a store in Canada, a leather store, uh, a lot of cowboy tack and uh, a lot of tandy stuff. I actually got on with the owner really, really well and took some lessons from him in the end. But the first time I went in there, I asked for vegetable tanned leather. He said, uh, so what are you making? And I said, well, I'm making a knife um and i want to make a sheath so he kind of took me through the different uh thicknesses and different types of leather that i could use and and threads and things like that and ended up making a sheath for the knife now when i'd finished uh, the most fun i had in the entire project was actually making the sheath and uh i ended up putting like a maple leaf on the front um as an i guess an ode to the canadian outdoors uh, and any time I take the knife out to show people, everybody would always remark on, on the sheath itself. And I actually got some commission work from people. The first one was a, a chef who wanted me to make some sheaths for his knives that he had. And, uh, and it kind of all started from there. So I still have the knife, rarely use it. It's too thick. I don't really like it. The handle geometry is a little bit off, but you know, it was my first and uh, no, maybe not last. I make sky I make my own skiving knives, but uh, I never made another outdoor knife. But uh, plenty of shoes <laughs> and a lot of leather work ever since. So yeah, sometimes your uh, your vocation finds you. You know, you get to do a lot of things in life, and then something just sticks out, and uh, and you find uh, your talent or perhaps even your purpose in that sense. But yes, so. To go back to what to your question, what was the first leather project I ever did? It was a knife sheath. Yeah. Fond memories, actually. I still have that knife sheath. Pretty good. It's uh, stitched together with bowstring. I think it's Dacron. Anyway, I used to make my own long bows and, and recurve bows and things like that as well. And uh, yeah, so I had plenty bowstring. So I use that to stitch it together. Thank you for sharing, says Adam. Yeah, no worries, buddy. Any time. So this, uh, this zip gusset I'm stitching in here, a little bit different. I'm not actually having to use a bladed awl because I've actually gone through the leather, punctured through the leather with my pricking iron, which is not particularly thick. Then I've gone ahead and stuck on my zip tape. And then I've gone ahead and stuck on the lining, which has a, a turned edge of the canvas, onto the zip tape. So I don't actually need to cut through the material. So it's one of the benefits of, of having a material lining is you can actually just use, I mean, this is a sailmaker's needle in a collet all. So that there is uh, actually blunted by me. So it doesn't cut through. I mean, if I press hard enough, it will, but uh, there's no blade on it, it's just round. So as I'm pushing through, I'm going through the pre-cut leather and I'm simply pushing the fibers of the zip tape uh, and the canvas apart so that I'm not having to cut through any material. And the benefit of that is uh, obviously it keeps the structural integrity of the weave so with time and use, we're not prematurely wearing anything out. So leather is a non-woven material, it doesn't suffer the same problems as woven materials when cut. Because you can get a lot more fraying. And generally to avoid it, you have to bond the leather or glue it well, or turn an edge uh, to sometimes prevent that from happening. So yes, yeah, it's just a sailmaker's needle and a collet or you could use a round awl as well. Just uh, it can't be too wide with a fine stitch. If it was a larger stitch, I'd perhaps 
um, change it to just using a regular round all. But on a fine stitch like this, you know, you're working with a small hole, you don't want to overstretch it. Um, may not end up with the best looking stitches in the end otherwise. Sajid says, hello master, what do you think about Rakagni zippers, also Riri? No, I haven't had the pleasure of, of working with Rakagni zippers, or Lampo for that matter, too, that I would really like to try. Uh, I've, for many years, used Riri zippers, and, and I do like their quality, but recently I've uh, tried YKK's Excella line, uh, and I find it a little bit of a, a step up from Riri. That's not to say that I don't think Riri are, are good good zips for luxury goods. I mean, I've, I've used them for years, but uh, I do find the Accela uh, a little bit better, a little bit smoother, a little bit more polished. Um, just a, kind of a side-by-side -side comparison. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love one day to, to actually do a video, but it'd be really difficult to get where I can get four zips of the same size, um, and keeping everything the same with, you know, the major brands like Rakagni, Lampo, um, YKK, Accela and Riri, and just, you know, test them side by side, see what kind of friction we're working with quality macro close-up shots but i mean i i can get small quantities of riri and uh excella but in the uk especially getting small quantities of of lampo and you know i don't need a hundred meters to do a review and that's one size one zip tape color one tooth style and many other variables it gets expensive quickly if you want to stock up um but yeah I'd love to do a, a comparison. I think Rakagni is used by Tom Ford. Yeah, I believe it's Rakagni. Yeah, Rakagni and Lampo, I believe, are Italian. Excella, Japanese, Riri, or wherever it's made, I don't know, but they're a Swiss brand. I mean, there are a few others whose names I forget. You've got cheaper brands like Prim, uh, Opti Zips, by Coats, which is a UK brand, and a few others, a few Chinese brands as well. Generally not luxury zips in there from the China. Uh, okay, so question. Hi, Phil. How do you pack your products? Are you talking about uh, packaging, as in, you know, when you're shipping, that kind of thing? Uh, usually, if, if that's your question, in, a, in a, a dust bag, which I used to purchase, now I teach full time, but when I have my full-time business guy in Finch, England, uh, that would usually, for something like this, be a, a very large dust bag, and then it goes inside a box. And usually I do my own branding on the outside. You know, I take a, cu a cutting of leather, especially the leather that you're working on on the product, foil stamp it with your logo, and then you can glue it straight onto the box. And, uh, and you can stitch it if you want to be a little extra onto the dust bag. It was a Danish company that used to supply that. I can't remember the name though. Working on my last project, uh, cylinder travel humidor. Oh, nice. 
came across some issues which could be quite tricky to resolve. Have you ever made cylindrical products other than the watch case? Yeah, if you're, look, if you're talking about like a tube, uh, then yes, yes, I have. Probably not something that slim, if you know what I mean. Usually it's a, a container, that kind of thing. But if you're making a, a cylinder for, yeah, like a travel humidor, what are you, what are you keeping the moisture in with? I take it maybe you have a metal on the inside or something like that. Or is it, um, I'm, I'm thinking of it of, of like a one cigar tube. You're probably making something for four or five cigars, right? A handful of Robustos. In that case, yeah, it would be a little bit larger. That would probably be easier to stitch. Certainly taking a while to stitch this, <laughs> three millimeters. So there's a good old length of, uh, yeah, almost, th almost three quarters of a meter each side. So three millimeters a stitch. Can figure out how many stitches that's going to be. This is podcast territory normally. <laughs> Oops, actually got the end of the clams because I'm a bit high on this stool for these French clams. Uh, I've actually got them kind of, well, I say locked into the side of the table, placed on the side of the table. So I have to be careful it doesn't fall. And I'm stitching this in with Philly Chinois, 432. So not too thin. I do like a bit of a prominent stitch when I'm contrasting. I'm not a big fan of really delicate stitches for a given stitch spacing. Like 632 is actually getting a little bit small, even for three millimeter, I think. Some people really like that kind of thin stitch look. It's a bit of a delicate look, but if, uh, if you're making something like a bag, it's not the best idea. Maybe a wallet, but even then. Yeah, mom. It's a little more, more tricky when you're stitching because I actually can't see the rear side. I'm feeling for it with my needle. But when you've got canvas, which is such an open weave, it really does catch the end of your needle sometimes and lead you astray. Uh, da, 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 da. Is smaller calf side hide? The less something has lived, <laughs> sad as that sounds, the less time something has lived, the less time it had to attain damage, scratches, bites from insects, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so yeah, that can mean mean higher quality. And uh, does it mean a tighter grain? Yeah, generally, generally. Baby calf, I wish there was a nicer way of saying that. Baby calf is <laughs> nice to work with. Hey, I didn't kill it. I didn't eat it either. <laughs> Some people do. <laughs> I'm sure it's nice. Veal, I think, is just calf, but baby calf, I don't know. It's a very small calf. I've worked with it, with it once or twice. It's very fine, good quality leather, as you would imagine. It mean though, isn't it? 
<laughs> At least uh, a small goat, they call it kid skin. Better than calling it baby goat. I don't think you'd sell much if you said baby goat. <laughs> They're too cute. Way too cute. I remember once I went to a friend of mine's house and on their on their property they had like a a hobby farm. And they had a little pen with uh, these little, little baby goats. And uh, we went in there to play with them and they were trying to, you know, headbutt you constantly. You just have to keep swiping them out of the way because they, they just wouldn't stop. And one of them managed to escape. And uh, we had to run after it. <laughs> and uh, I think I had a, a belly full of scotch at the time. But it, was, it was rather hilarious. But I ma actually managed to pull a hamstring running after a baby goat. Uh, which was quite painful. It was like went all black the next day. It was pretty bad. No, no further injuries from it though. But uh, anyway, uh, and in the in the end, we just couldn't get it. It was just too fast. So uh, someone had the bright idea of playing the victim, and then running away from the goat when it got near, and the goat would then chase it, and it they just ran back into the pen, and the goat followed. You know. <laughs> Brains over brawn. <laughs> oh, fun times. So, yeah, they're rather cute. Annoying, but cute. Make sure that's in there. All right, let's move this up a little bit. Starting to get some distance on here, which is good. I'll give you a little tip as well, guys. Whenever you're stitching a zip, one of the biggest issues is people love to, to pull with loads of tension on absolutely everything. Tension doesn't necessarily mean strength. When you add more tension, you're just preloading the thread. There's only so much before it has uh, before it breaks. It's breaking strain. So if you're adding tons of tension to the thread. Uh, any additional tension during its lifespan, it makes it get it closer to its limit. So one of the areas you really don't want to add too much tension is around a zip, because when you stitch, you're putting tension on comp compressible materials. And the compressible materials in, in this case is calf leather, uh, polyester zip tape, which is what the teeth of the zipper are attached to, and also canvas. Now, all of those things are quite compressible. And every stitch, you know, you're compressing it one or two percent, say, over the entire length of, you know, almost three quarters of a meter. That then really becomes a shortened distance. But there's one thing that this is all attached to, which isn't compressible at all. Can you guess what that is? If anybody tell me, see if anyone can get it right, of what in all this here is not compressible. See if anyone alive can actually get it. If not, I'll just tell you. <laughs> and I'll tell you why that becomes a problem. Let's move that a little bit. Be more comfortable. I've got dry hands today. I don't know why. I think I've washed them too many times. Every time you're working on a project, you're working with edge paint and things like that, and then you're going back and touching canvas. Canvas really does pick up dirt very easily from your from your hands if you overhandle it is why it works as an interior, but not so much as an exterior. Um, so I have to keep washing my hands. I think I've dried them out. I'm just going to re put that needle. The zipper, says Rick. The zipper. 
So yeah, the zip, specifically the zip teeth. So the zip teeth are all metal and they're all touching each other. Uh, and that will not compress. So when you're compressing all the materials around it, but the metal itself can't compress, it compensates by creating a wave. It will start going up and down. So it starts looking like it's a little wave all the way along. And you've probably seen it before. You may even have experienced it. The dreaded zip wave. And there's not a lot that can be done about it, unfortunately, once it's done. It's a case of lesson learned, so unless you want to unstitch absolutely everything. But most of the time, zips aren't particularly short, so that would be a lot of work. And it's very easy just to, when you're pulling the thread in, as soon as it sinks just below the surface, that's it. That's all you need. And later on, we'll be hammering all this down so we can prevent wear and tear from the stitches by hammering it nice and flat. You know, especially true if you're working with, you know, vegetable tan leather where you've actually made a groove for the stitching to go into a more Western style. You really don't need hardly any tension. You're just holding everything in place. Uh, the lining won't really compress. Well, the lining is, um, well, whether it's leather, leather or canvas, yes, it's very compressible, unfortunately, which is where the issue comes from. So your stitches are actively trying to shorten what you're stitching. If ever you stitch uh, chrome tanned leather, you can really notice it, especially if it's very soft garment leather or someone tries to use upholstery leather for stitching things or making things from and then stitching them. You really do notice uh, a shortening effect going on. Sajid so says, the voice is not clear. Is that true, guys? It's, uh, Everyone able to hear me? If you're watching this after the fact, I do have a, a, another question. And you guys in the live can answer this too if you want to. Uh, I, I did ask this in a previous live. I can't remember what the outcome was. But I've, lately I've started doing more YouTube lives. But I kind of want to know whether or not it's better to have it in vertical or horizontal. I think vertical as we have now because... You know, re people really are um, watching more YouTube videos from their mobile device now than, uh, than laptop. I mean, I'm a laptop guy through and through. I watch it on my TV. I like to uh, get more of a, an experience. But a, a lot of people on the fly um, prefer using the vertical format because they're using their phone. So just let me know in the comments section below or if you're on the live now, let me know what you prefer. So I'd love to know your thoughts on whether or not you want lives in horizontal in the future. I'm getting some jittering in the audio. Oh, that's a shame. Okay, well, give it another, I'll give it another couple of minutes. And if it's, uh, if it's still bad, what I'll do is uh, I'll restart. See how it goes. It might be the internet, it might be the phone, it might be YouTube. It's really difficult to tell. Audio equipment I'm using is pretty good, though. It's going to be quite reliable. As a video guy, I prefer landscape. Yeah, same. But everything, everything's changing to mobile, right? You, I notice a lot more websites these days are optimized for mobile. You can always tell because it sucks from a, a, a laptop. <laughs> but that's what Google wants because that's what people are using these days. Hold 
halfway through my thread now. What time is it? 10 to 7. Let's see if we can finish this in the next 10 minutes. Don't know about that. Yeah, any questions, guys? Feel free to ask away. No problem at all. Sometimes it's clear that 80% crackly, jittery. Hmm. I'll have to view it afterwards. I mean, I'll, this live, I'll put it up as an... Uh, it will go up as a permanent video, as lives on YouTube do. Uh, but if it's that bad, I'll probably just pull it. Mind you, uh, most people watch about... <laughs> on. on most videos, only the first few minutes anyway. Very few uh, dedicated people will get, actually get this far. <laughs> Strangely enough. I guess it depends on how interested in the subject you are. So maybe I'll keep it up. Maybe someone will take one piece of advice from here and it will change the way they do things. It can make all the difference to someone. Everything's looking good on the rear side. I can definitely tell summer's coming on. It's almost seven o'clock and it's still bright sunshine outside, which is nice. It's been uh, raining earlier today. About time summer got here. Adam says, I'm here to the bitter end. <laughs> oh, that's good to hear. Right, let's move these uh, sliders up. So you notice there's two sliders here. And this is specialist zip tape, so it's not regular uh, zip teeth. What you have here, each one is identical. Normally what you have is, a, is one that has a, like a divot and then a cup, and it fits into the other one. Um, so the rear of one and, you know, that kind of thing. So it's, it's not symmetrical. These are symmetrical zip teeth. So each tooth has a divot and a cup on each side. And that means there's the same level of tension going each way. So this is two-way zip tape. And this configuration head-to-head -head, allows the opening of the bag and the closing of the bag. Uh, so this would be opposite to, you know, a jacket, for example, that you can undo from the top, I think. Uh, but what happens is if you get regular zip tape that you would use on clothing, uh, and you can use them on sandbags as well if it's just one slider, but if you use regular zip tape with two sliders, one way on one of the sliders and the opposite way is absolutely fine, and the other one is facing in the wrong direction, is really gritty and hard to move. It's possible, it just doesn't want to do it. And if you pull both at the same time, one's going to be really easy and you have to hold the bag and pull the other one. So it's not an ideal situation. So for this configuration, you really want two-way zip tape. And all most major brands, you know, Riri and Excella, they actually do it. Uh, they make it. Uh, and it's it's mainly in leather goods, bags, things like that. Generally can be a bit more expensive, but it definitely makes a difference in you know, the, the friction that you feel when opening and closing the bag. You know, if you're making luxury goods, you want your hardware to perform and feel luxurious. Uh, I have a stitching pony from Dream Factory. Should I invest in, a, in larger clams for larger work like you're doing? Any recommendations? Says Rick. 
Um, yeah, I, I too have, uh, I'm looking at them now, the mini clamps from Dream Factory. Um, sorry, it's a bit of a mess in here, a bit of a mess. You can kind of see them right there. Um, they were very kindly given to me for free, uh, likely in the hopes of doing a review. I didn't do a review. Um, the build quality is nice. It just, the, the, and I still use them from time to time, but if you're using long thread and it might not be a problem on the larger ones because they're, the apparatus at the bottom is further away, but they get caught, the threads get caught constantly, um, which could be infuriating. Uh, but I think it might not be so much of an issue on the larger clams where, you know, the the apex of where it was holding your leather goods has got a longer throat, so it's a little bit further away from um, from all the little tightening knobs and adjustment knobs and things like that. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's nice quality, but, um, yeah, I wouldn't use it for something like this. It, you, you know, the larger ones, perhaps, uh, you know, but when you're stitching in, a larger projects and you need to fit, you know, when I'm stitching in the corner protectors. So these things here, when I'm stitching these in later on, is that the right side? No, it's the wrong side. I'll need to, you know, place this inside the clams. Um, and it's just much easier when you've got something that has the capacity to take a, a larger payload essentially. Um, there's, a, there's always a case for having them. Recommendations wise, I'd probably go uh, for French clams. The English clams are good, but sometimes holding them open and feeding a large object, you have to have a block of wood to jam it open to do that. So it's a bit of a pain. Uh, the French ones are great because it's just the tension of my legs holding these closed. But at the same time, uh, if you prefer to be able to see both sides of your work, obviously I'm looking down, I can only see the face side of the stitches here, I can't see the rear side underneath. So you have to be able to stitch by feel. Uh, for example, as I take my awl, whether it's bladed or not, as I pierce through on the opposite side, I have my needle and I'm placing it underneath where I can feel the blade or the another needle in this case, in the end of the awl, but say it was a blade. Uh, I'm placing it underneath and feeling for it so that as I extract this, what should happen is, I said what should happen is, <laughs> I've got it caught on the, uh, on the canvas there. Oh, see this is a classic example of going from unconscious competence to uh, conscious incompetence, I believe. Uh, yeah, so what's happening now is as I pull that out generally, what happens is the needle will sink through the, the widening that you've just made with the end of this awl. Um, so if you, can, if you can stitch by feel, then the French clams are great. One of the benefits of the English clams, of course, is you can stitch perfectly upright or you can stitch on an angle like I'm doing. So it really depends on what your preference is. Um, Benefit of stitching upright, of course, is you'll be able to clearly see both sides of the work. And if that's something that works better for you, then, you know, it's, it's going to be a, a worthy investment. Uh, these are Jerome David clams. Uh, if you tell me what country you're in, I might be able to tell you a company or supplier that might be able to get one to you. Generally speaking, they're not overpriced for what they are. I mean, they're, I don't, know, I don't know what wood they are, but they're very nicely made. The English clams come from Abbey, England. I refinished those myself. I think those are made from uh, laminated beech wood. Uh, last Q&A got me to look into using materials again. Cool, like fabrics. Um, can you, all right, yeah, okay. can you get canvas from Liberty? Only ever seen cotton and silk, unsure on their durability. Um, anything to keep in mind with working with them? 
for God's sake. For cotton and silk, well, it depends on the thickness, right? Um, I really, I really prefer. I mean, sometimes if it's an if I know what I'm buying into, especially from a specific tannery, I don't mind buying some leather sight unseen. Uh, but when it comes to fabrics, I'll, I really like to go to a haberdashery or uh, a shop that sells it off the roll and, and really kind of feel what I'm buying rather than just visually. So if I'm buying something that isn't particularly local and I can't get to London at the time, um, then I'll just order samples online, um, which most companies don't mind selling. It doesn't really cost them much. Some charge you delivery fees, but that's fine. Uh, and then really get a feel for it. It's really difficult. Sometimes, you know, a seven ounce canvas might feel thicker than a, you know, a comparable seven ounce canvas from somewhere else. You know, it depends on the weave density and there's all sorts of different variables with, with material. But um, silk, you know, silk linings are really nice, luxurious uh, for small bags, clutches, uh, wallets, especially things like that. I really wish you can get moire silk again. It's just, it's just such a pain to, to try and get hold of. If anyone knows what that is, it's, it almost has a... A wave to it in the look it's it's bunched up and then steamed and it changes the way it looks so it almost looks like water it's like a, a quilted look it's really nice um very traditional method and a lot of english and french leather goods used to have it you know decades and decades ago but just getting hold of it now oh just just to have that again it'd be really nice for interiors i'd love that they used to even put it in jewelry boxes and things like that. You can get fake moire now, usually made from synthetic silks. And it's dyed to look like that, but it's a um, shadow of what it could be. Moire silk. Good stuff. Good stuff, sir. All right, seven o'clock. I can't believe how time's gone by so quickly. Uh, I'm going to call it a day. I'm trying to end my work days a little earlier. I know, 7 o'clock in the evening. <laughs> That's early for me. Trying to give myself a little bit more decompression time, but I am getting up earlier these days, so... Swings and roundabouts. But I'm going to call it a day, guys. Let me show you what I've done so far. Uh, also, any book recommendations for trunk making in leather craft in general? Uh, I don't believe one exists, my friend. Uh, I would love to. If one, I would love to be proven wrong. So I'm going to say fact. No book exists on trunk making. And someone somewhere will be able to not help themselves if they know about a book about trunk making and be like, you're wrong. Here's one. I'll be like, I'm happy to be wrong. <laughs> But there are books that mention it, but don't go in, into enough detail. You know, they'll probably give you enough in, information to be dangerous. But uh, apart from that, uh, there just isn't anything on trunk making. Um, you know, I've, I've got f a couple of friends, actually, one in France, one in the UK, uh, who've actually let me go over there and go through their collection. And, and <laughs> one of them, I was asking him a question once, I was like, how does Baton do this on their trunks. So he just got one out and just literally got his hand and ripped it open because he repairs them, right? He knows how to do, <laughs> how to repair. So, it, you know, he doesn't care. He, he knows that he's not doing enough damage to, uh, to care. He's just like, I don't know. So he ripped it up and he was in, curious as well and uh, found out. But uh, the best way is, is to, uh, to purchase vintage trunks and, and take them apart. I've done that a couple of times before. And also gone to see collections with my notebook and uh, my camera and just taken photographs of different hinge arrangements, uh, different box configurations, compartments, things like that. And just to kind of learn by looking at what the craftsman did to, to navigate a problem, how to hide a hinge or how to insert a lock and how to rivet and what kind of rivets, what the rivets are made from. 
uh, what materials are available. So it's, it's kind of like decoding a mystery in that sense. But for a book, maybe I'll write one one day, uh, not on a large scale, usually smaller trunks, no bigger than, say, a hat box. Um, and, uh, but I've done a lot of restoration on them before. I used to buy them on eBay. Uh, and then restore them myself. The same with a lot of different vintage leather goods, attache cases and things like that. Um, I would restore them and then uh, take better photographs than the original and sell them for a much higher price. So it's kind of just added income as well. So if I was slow on orders, I'd just be doing this in the background. Um, but you, you get to learn a lot. So, you know, maybe buy one or two trunks, something that looks like what you'd like to make and and try restoring it and it's amazing what you'll actually learn about restoration but also about the construction of, of the trunk at the same time so if there isn't any books um learn from the masters directly and and take apart their work pick apart their work all right um thread gets caught all the time super annoying uh, try pulling a thread through just a tad slower and see if it, uh, oh, can it caught, not getting knotted up, sorry. Uh, yeah, that's a pain, if there are any appendages sticking out at the time. Um, have you heard of Moore and Giles Leather? They're located in my town. I get a lot of leather goods from them. Uh, I'm going to say no. It, the name rings a bell, but I, I, I don't know. If you told me that it was a bad company, I'd probably believe you. I don't know them that much. Um, there is one in French. Is it or is it the book by Le Manicois um, on restoration rather than trunk manufacture from scratch? Because I have that. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, restoration of, of trunks. It's, I mean, I've got it and I've Google translated the whole thing. Um, and I've, I've been to the guy's house, Jean Pierre, JP. Um, Really nice guy, good restorer too. But I, I don't think you're going to actually make uh, much from that. You might glean some information to uh, that might give you a step up in that kind of thing. You know, if you're restoring and, and replacing materials, it might give you an idea what kind of materials. But as for you know, starting from scratch, starting with you know, like pop supply and coated canvas and um, all your corners and hardware rivets and every battens and everything like that, and zinc sheeting and uh, internal canvases and quilting and various different things. Uh, I don't think it's going to give you a step up. It's nice to have, you can buy it as a, an ebook, but um, yeah. Uh, the hinging has always confused me. Yeah, it's one of the, one of the things, isn't it? Sometimes it seems to go for attached after covering. But Goyard has a way of hiding hinges completely on all trunks that I can't wrap my head around. I'll give you a hint. Sometimes it's not made of metal. <laughs> all right, guys, that's all I have time for. Thank you very much for joining me on this live. Apologies if there's been any uh, choppy uh, camera action going on there and the sound, that kind of thing. But I uh, appreciate you troopers following me through and, uh, and chatting to me live. So thanks a lot. Uh, don't forget, we still have the Tool Buyer's Guide and Leather Selection video at Leather Craft Master.